More than 30% of Americans have not made their full housing payments for July, including 19% who made no housing payments at all. And as some unemployment benefits are set to expire at the end of the month, we could expect to see a number of defaults to increase. Coupled with the end of eviction moratoriums, many households are really on edge. Even the banks know that this is not normal. Many of the heavy hitters like J.P. Morgan, Citigroup and Wells Fargo have been bracing for an avalanche of default loans because of coronavirus. Here to weigh in on what banks, renters and homeowners can expect, not to mention everyone, is Professor of Economics Richard Wolf. Welcome back to the show, sir. Always great to see you. Good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at numbers like this, I mean, what can we equate this to and what can we expect going forward? Well, frankly, you can't equate it to anything. It is the worst crash uh, that we have experienced now, even in comparison to the Great Depression of the 1930s, partly because it hit so quickly and cut so deeply into our economy. We already knew that our economic system had meant that half our people could not handle a uh, $1,000 unexpected sudden expense. They simply couldn't do it. They didn't have enough money in the bank. They couldn't manage. Now you've given them a much bigger problem, months for many of them, uh, of rent not paid, of mortgage payments not made. During that time, the landlords couldn't collect, which means in turn the landlords couldn't pay off their debts to the banks since they had borrowed in many cases uh, and this is true, by the way, for commercial rents, just as much, if not more, than for residential rents. So, yes, an avalanche is coming, but it is also a sign, and this is the key point, of a breakdown in our normal capitalist relationships. Tenants cannot pay their rent. Landlords cannot pay off their debts. Everybody is gearing up to go into court, organizing their lawyers to file thousands of lawsuits, we're looking at months, if not years, of crushing litigation, which is also an expense which people will not be able to carry. It is a tsunami in economic terms. Yeah, I think that's such an important point. And Professor, one of the things that we caught our eye this morning is that J.P. Morgan is setting aside $10 billion to cover expected losses. And I think you can explain that no bank in the country sets aside huge amounts of money to cover losses if it is not a near certainty that is going to happen. But most Americans do not have $10 billion in capital in order to cover their losses. What is the magnitude of loss that we are about to see on a personal wealth level? I think on a personal wealth level, we're going to see a surge in homelessness, people who cannot in any way, shape or form manage this situation. If you are evicted, you can't cover the cost of a lawyer to protect you against this eviction, especially because the lawyer may not be able to prevail against the kind of legal heavy hitting that banks can afford, that large landlords can afford. We're going to have this spectacle on top of all of the, everything else happening to us of that American situation in which we have homeless people sitting on the curb across the street from unoccupied apartments and homes. And that does not become a sustainable situation like so many other things are becoming unsustainable. Hmm. Professor, I mean, I look at it the same way that you do. It's like an avalanche is coming. We cover these numbers every day. 40% you know, of child care centers say that they are going to have to permanently close their doors. Small business closures are not declining. They are actually accelerating. Third of homeowners unable to make their payments, unable to make their rent. Week after week, millions more people filing for unemployment. And yet there seems to be this total disconnect, both from the stock market, but that is just like a representation of elites in America where either it, they feel that it's not going to affect them whatsoever or they're unable to see what's going on. It makes me feel like, like, am I crazy? Are they crazy? Just speak to that complete disconnect that we're all witnessing, which is incredibly disorienting. Well, it's partly a reality and partly a kind of economic uh, card game. Here's the reality. Inequality in the United States, which was very severe before all of this hit in March and was itself a contributor to the crash, has now become even worse. You all know the numbers that we have 50 million people filing for unemployment 
and Jeffrey Bezos, just to pick one, has an increase of $20 billion in his already stupendous wealth. These are realities that are unsustainable, emotionally, politically, ideologically. Everything will crumble in the face of this harsh reality. Number two, we have something which psychologists call mass denial. The people at the top seem to imagine, wrongly, historically proven over and over again, that somehow the mass of people can be plunged into really abject suffering and it will not somehow come back to bother them. They are in for a rude shock. Finally, the stock market. The stock market is no mystery at all. The Federal Reserve has pumped trillions of new money, uh, dollars worth of new money into our economy. That new money is not going to hire people or to produce more goods or to expand enterprises because we have a crashed economy. The folks out there can't buy what we would produce now normally, let alone if we increase. So where does the money go? Answer, into the stock market. The people who get it, the banks, the large corporations, the wealthy, take the new money, buy shares of stock, bid them up, and so you get this disconnect, as you rightly put it, that is, as I want to stress, historic evidence proves over and over again, this cannot persist, especially in a country like ours that for the previous century prided itself on creating a large middle class. Mm -hmm. And Professor, just to let's lay this out for the audience, what do the tipping points look like? Because I feel like, you know, we're always like, oh, it's about to come, it's about to come. When are we going to know that things are on a slide downward? Or are we already there? We just can't see it. We're already on the slide down where we don't want to face it, but it, it's all around us. That's why we're talking about a tsunami of evictions coming on top of the catastrophe we're already going through. And while I don't believe we, we can get away with blaming Mr. Trump, he certainly carries a good portion of the blame, but this is a systemic problem that has been building a long time. That's why people don't have the savings to get through this situation. That's why they're laboring under unprecedented debt. So, yeah, it'll be lots of little things, each one adding up. But at some point, and I can't predict it any better than anyone else, it will be one too many, and then we'll see it in a way that no one will be able to deny. And when you say these conditions cannot persist, looking throughout history, what does that mean? Well, to give you an example from our own history, the 1930s. After four years, which wasn't that long, 29 to 33, everything shifted. A center of the road Democrat, Franklin Roosevelt, came into office and suddenly, to the surprise of everyone, we had a tsunami of demands from below. We had a, a labor union movement, the likes of which we had never seen. The CIO in the 1930s, in the middle of a depression, organized millions of people into unions. These were people who had never been in a union before, whose parents had never been in a union. They simply joined unions because they were desperate, they were upset, they couldn't imagine getting through this situation unless they were unified in some way in an organization. We had, we had tens of thousands of Americans join socialist parties, communist parties. We had things happen that put together the so-called New Deal coalition. And they went to the government and they said, you better do something to help the mass of people through this unprecedented catastrophe. And Franklin Roosevelt, the president at the time, literally the opposite of a Mr. Trump, he heard them and he understood politically that they had millions of people with them. And so suddenly, look what happened. We created social security in America. We gave every person over 65 bucks uh, 65 years of age, a check every month for the rest of their lives. We created unemployment compensation at the federal level. We had never had that either. We created the first minimum wage in America, so no employer could pay a person so little that they couldn't live. And finally, we hired the government, the federal government hired 15 million Americans, giving them a job, giving them an income, allowing them to pay their mortgage and their rent, uh, these were unheard of things then, and they were revolutionary in their way. And I suspect we are going to see pretty soon something similar. It'll have its own historic moment and its special forms. But basically, we're going to see something like that 
And when you see that happen, watch out. We're going to have big changes in this country, just like the ones in the 1930s changed our history after that. So, Professor, that's sort of the hopeful scenario. I think most people would see that as a, as a hopeful direction that you're going to have more worker power. You're going to have a, a new, you know, renewed safety net that people are going to come together to forge a better future for the country and re rethink the basic economic bargain that we have today. But there's another uglier potential path that is what scares me here as well. Um, I mean, do you agree with that, first of all? And if so, could you sketch out some of that side of the coin? Absolutely. You never have the opportunity for the good news without also the risk of the bad and vice versa. I mean, for good or for bad, these things come together. Yes, we could have the alternative. We could see a government like Mr. Trump's, they would certainly be capable of it, responding to an upswing from below of demands of the sort that we had in the 1930s. And you could have a response to that by ratcheting up scapegoating looking for immigrants or foreigners or Lord knows who they'll come up with as a person or group or uh, community to target with the blame, hoping to deflect people's genuine and justified upset onto an absurd target. Mr. Trump has already been doing that. He's tried it with immigrants. He now attacks the Chinese, whoever he can think of that will draw people's anger away from himself and on to something else. Can that happen? Yes. In Germany, which was in many ways the most progressive of the capitalist countries in the 1920s, it went extremely the other way into Hitler and Nazism as a consequence of the crash of 1929. Can that happen in the United States? Of course it can. The forces are here that push in that direction. That will be the struggle. Indeed, that already is visible in its embryo with Mr. Trump on the right and Bernie Sanders on the left. And that, that struggle isn't over. We're at the early stages of that conflict. Well, some very grim words there. Thank you, Professor. Appreciate it. Great to have you, Professor. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next on Rising, Trump campaign senior communications director, he responds to new polling that says Texas is a 2020 swing state. That when Rising continues.